Well, it's Wednesday night. Time for a faith lift. Glory to God. It's always time for a faith lift, isn't it? You know, you're either building your faith or you're corrupting it. Have you noticed that? And depending on the conversations you have in life and the people that you associate with, it's either building your faith or it's corrupting your faith. Have you noticed that? And it's everywhere. It's everywhere you go. And this is just a side thought as we lead into the message. But, you know, there's a strong undercurrent out there. Um, a strong undercurrent, and it's always pulling and always trying to pull you in a direction that is anything but Christ-like and godly, because that's the way of the world, isn't it? And that scripture that talks about we are in the world, but we're not of it. You know that we're here. I see you. We're all here right now. But we're not of this world. And so you are involved in many different endeavors, and there are different things that you do, uh, and, and everything that you are a part of has an undercurrent, a toe, a pull. And so you want to be very careful that no matter what you do every day, make sure that you decontaminate your faith. Make sure you decontaminate it. Um, you know, some things that you know aren't right. Well, get that worked out later. You know, you can't help but have certain conversations. You know, people say things all the time, you know, um, just any number of things. And I don't want to read anybody's mail and make any, make anybody feel bad this early into the message, but there are just some things that we say that are not biblical. They're just not scriptural, you know. Um, I mean, you know what the Bible says, money is the root of all kinds of evil. Well, well no, the, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. It never says that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. And so you hear that all the time, you know, money is the root. No, it's not. The love of it. There's nothing wrong with you having money. In fact, I want you to have lots of it so that you can share some of it with the church. So I'm rooting for you. I'm rooting for you. My daughters uh, came uh, yesterday. They said, hey, somebody got up at the grocery store here in town. They got uh, a scratch off. Um, I, I assume you know what that means, a scratch off, right? Ticket, lottery ticket thing. And the, and the guy won $10,000 right here. And I'm like, oh, is he going to give some to the church? Well, he doesn't go to church. And even if he did, he probably wouldn't. Oh, so don't forget the church when you get lots of money. Okay, all right. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Uh, now, just to give you a little bit of context here, because I'm going to focus on one verse. Um, <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, church, church life is a life of uh, many rules. Uh, and disciplines. And church life can be very confusing depending on the church that you are a part of, the church that you grew up in. Uh, there are any number of things. Uh, there are a lot of rules and regulations that come with church life. I mean, I grew up in a denomination that was very rigid and very structured. Uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, you follow the rules and you do things the same way every time without deviation. And so here in Romans chapter 14, uh, contextually speaking, uh, Paul is dealing with some, some rules, uh, dietary rules, regulations, restrictions, etc. Uh, in fact, in my Bible, uh, it just, it says here at the top of the chapter, the strong must bear the infirmities, uh, of the weak. So in order to give you the context, I want to go ahead and look at some other, uh, verses in this chapter. And then we'll hone in on that one verse that I want to look at, okay? So chapter 14, verse 1, him that is weak in faith. He starts off right out of the chute, man. Somebody weak in faith. Can you be weak in faith? Well, sure you can. If you can be strong in faith, you can be weak in faith. Him that is weak in faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes, verse 2, that he may eat all things. Another, who is weak, eats herbs. Well, what what does that mean exactly? Uh, people who avoid meat. Uh, you eat herbs, you eat vegetables only. Uh, okay. But the Bible, I mean, this is hard now, and, and, and this is just, this is the King James Version. He who is weak eats only herbs. Verse 3, let not him that eats despise him that eats not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eats, for God hath received him. Verse 4, who art thou that, that judges another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. 
Verse 5, one man esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord. He that regards not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and gives God thanks. Okay. You, whatever you do with the food is your business. Whatever you do with the days, it's your business. You know, some of us have this idea that every day belongs to the Lord. Some of us have this idea that this is the day that the Lord has made. Right now, today. Well, what happens tomorrow? Same attitude. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. What about next week? Same thing, every day of the week. Every day, it belongs to God. Every day is special to me. There's no difference. I woke up this morning. Well, praise God, my job must not be done on planet Earth. I woke up. It's a special day. When I get to tomorrow, it's going to be the same attitude. Now, other people don't feel that way. Big deal. That's their business. You're doing it as under the Lord. Who cares what you do? That's your business. That's between you and God. Okay, so verse uh, 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. So you invite somebody from church over. And you know good and well that they don't eat meat. And so Randy's going to invite me over and I don't eat beefsteak. That's a lie I do. So I, <laughs> And so Randy knows I don't eat steak. But what is he serving that day? Steak. Ah, sit down and eat, dude. It's good for you. Randy, huh, I'm appalled. You know that I abstain from meat for religious reasons. Ah, ah. Now I'm like, boy, I'm all messed up now emotionally and psychologically forever. And I'm messed up. I'm going to walk around with a twitch forever because Randy ate steak. No, I, I, <laughs> the point is, if you know that somebody has an issue, but yet you're going to make it an issue, that's wrong. It's wrong. Listen, I've had people tell me this. Well, pastor, I abstain. I don't eat pork and I don't eat. Okay. So when we go out and we get a bite to eat, I don't eat it in front of them. I don't, I don't order it in front of them. And if they come to my house, I'm not serving it to them. There was a question somebody asked. Uh, well, I better not go there because it has to do with alcohol. Um, I'll mention it anyway since I went ahead and said alcohol. <laughs> uh, somebody had said uh, that they went to another country and uh, that they were, um, you know, surprised at the alcohol. There was wine, and actually it was wine and beer on the table. And so um, the comment from the Christians, from the church people there in that other country, were, oh, yeah, that's right, you're an American Christian, you don't do this, or something to that effect. And I thought, isn't that interesting, the difference in cultures and difference in places and all. Now, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm just saying that there is a difference you need to be aware of. And if you exercise your liberty at the expense of someone else, that's not right. That's what Paul's talking about. Protect one another. Protect one another. Don't judge me. I won't judge you. Maybe you like Three Musketeers bars and you eat a lot of them. I don't know. Whatever it might be, some people feel like it's a sin to put sugar in your body and they judge you. Oh, you're going to eat another Three Musketeers bar? You're destroying the temple or you're des I've had people actually say that to me. That's too much sugar. You're, that's God's temple. You must not destroy God's temple. And Okay, wait a minute. I have liberty here. I can eat another butter peanut butter sandwich cookie, and I don't think that I'm sinning and can go to hell for it. But if it's a problem for you, it should be a problem for me. So let's just not do it. Let's just be mindful and, and not hurt one another. And hopefully, through proper teaching, we all start coming up in our thinking and we all start finding a balance. All things in moderation. You know, one peanut butter cookie is not really all that bad, but a whole package or a whole sleeve, now you got a problem. That's why I don't even go for the one. Those Oreos, forget it. If I start with one Oreo, i got to eat the whole package, so I don't even have one. So somebody had said to me, oh, it's okay, just have one or two. I can't, I, I, and I won't do it. All right, I'm just giving you the context here. That's not where I want to go, but I want to look at something in verse number. Oh, wait a minute, we, we got to look at verse 20. 
for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. It's always better to prefer your brother and sister and think about them. That's the bottom line, contextually speaking here. You guys mean that much to me that I'm not going to exercise my liberty at your expense, okay? Now, let me show you something here. Keep that in mind. Keep the context in mind, okay? Everybody good with their Oreos and their Snickers and all that? Just, you know, just keep them hidden. Uh, you know, praise the Lord. Verse number, I want to look at verse number 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Whew, that's good to know. The kingdom of God is not about dietary rules and restrictions and regulations. Yes, there's an element of wisdom involved. Absolutely. There is an element of wisdom involved, and there should be a balance, and there should be moderation. But the kingdom of God is not about these things. Well, then what's it about? Well, he tells you. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, hold on. That's pretty simple. So you're telling me, I don't have to get caught up in how much sugar somebody's eating. I don't have to get caught up whether they eat pork or whether they don't eat pork or whether they eat veggies only. Uh, I forget the term of the expression now. Um, is it called vegan or something? There's like different expressions out there. Vegan? Uh, yeah, uh, Chevy Vega. Uh, you know, um, I, I don't understand all that, and I don't really keep up on it, because if I find out that it bothers somebody, I just back way off of it and don't even say anything about it. But the kingdom of God is not about any of these things, and it's so simple he puts it into these three categories, righteousness, peace, and joy. And I'm glad that he does that. Because when in doubt, <clears throat> when in doubt about all these things, if you stick to, if you can't agree on sugar, if you can't agree on meat or even coffee, if you can't agree on any of those things, you can come together over righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, what's that about? Okay, righteousness is another place where we differ as well. Righteousness, basically, we can say, is right standing with God. Are you right with God? That's a big question to answer, isn't it? Because one day, you're going to want to make sure you have the right answer, because there will come a time when you will meet him face to face. And if you don't know that you have right standing with him, that's probably something you should put high on your bucket list. Am I right with God? Right? That should be number one. Get right with God. What's on your bucket list? Number one, get right with God. Well, how do I do that? Through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't come just so that we could have Christmas and Easter. He came to make us right. He came to bridge that gap and make us right with God. Our faith in Jesus makes us right. It brings us back into fellowship. It makes us right. It takes care of everything that the first Adam got us into mess over. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus, makes it all right. And now we're brought back into uh, right standing and we're considered righteousness. We're, we're, we're made in his likeness and image, in righteousness and in true holiness. So high on my bucket list ought to be, am I right with God? Well, how do I get right with God? Well, through um, attending my church regularly. No. How do I get right with God? By achieving and excelling in my field of endeavor. No. Nope. How do I get right with God? By not hurting anybody. No, well, no. None of these things work. You and God have to come together through the sacrifice of Jesus. You come to the Father through the cross. Come to the Father through the cross. Perfect. Okay. So the kingdom of God is not about pork and beef. The kingdom of God is not about wine or beer. Even though some people want to make it an issue. It's not. Now, there are some things that you ought to do and some things you ought not do, correct? But the bottom line is, if we're going to stay on track, because as I said to you before, there are many uh, currents pulling. There are things pulling us in different directions. And you can get swept away in a conversation and in an argument that isn't right. It's a waste of your time. Righteousness. Paul said it's righteousness. Are you right with God? Yes, I am. Are you right with God? I hope so. Well, how about you know so? How about you make it your business to know so, so that if you meet him tonight, there's no question about it. I love it when people say to me, Pastor, I'm not afraid to die. 
when they're ready and they're like, are you kidding? I am anxiously awaiting the time when I can look at him and see him. Wow, that's a great place to be. Okay, but he says it's about righteousness and peace. Peace. That word peace is an all-encompassing word. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. Wholeness, peace. So it's not just a good feeling, a peaceful feeling. Right? Who sang about that? The Eagles? Peaceful feeling? Peace is more than that. Nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken. That's what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is about you being right with God, and it's about you being whole. It's about you being whole in your emotions. It's about you being whole in your body. Listen, God is all about you being whole and restored, not about being broken. And, and sometimes, it, I mean, it is a lifelong project. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm still working on me, man. I still got to work through some things, but I'm working through them. And that's, that's what proper teaching will help you with, is it'll help you take your rightful place and partake of the benefits. It'll help you come to the table that he said, he sets a table before you in the presence of your enemies, in the presence of your enemies, in the presence of the things that have hurt you in the presence of the things that are still trying to hurt you, in the presence of things that will try to hurt you in the future, in the presence of loss, in the presence of, of failure, discouragement, lack, all of these things, enemies. He sets that table before you. And so through proper teaching, through instruction, through proper relationships, you can take your place at that table and experience the peace of God in your body, in your emotions in your family. You can experience the peace of God right in the midst of all kinds of confusion and chaos. That's what the kingdom of God is about. Think about, think about what we're losing out on when we choose to argue over the things that don't matter. Like, truly, do you know it doesn't matter? Democrat or Republican doesn't matter? I know some people want to make it an issue and they want to, they, you know, because of who you vote for, you become the enemy now. It's like, what? Where did that ever come from? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's president. Jesus Christ is still Lord of all. And we will still exalt him and glorify. I don't care what the law of the land says. You can't stop me from worshiping my God. And, and, and I'm serious about this. I mean, some people seem to think, you know, well, you know, it, it's a tragedy because this one got elected or that one didn't get elected and we're in trouble now. Folks, the best thing that could happen to the church is trouble. That's the best thing that could ever happen to us because it forces us to pray. It forces us to look upward. I'm not saying that God is the author of trouble. I'm not saying that at all. But you know that God can use trouble like nothing else in your life. When you come to a place of complete brokenness, when you are just beside yourself and you don't know what to do. Listen, I don't have to know what to do right now. Sometimes people make the mistake of thinking, well, you need to know what to do right now. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know what to do right now, but I know what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to get anxious. I'm not going to worry. And I'm sure not going to doubt and get into fear. I won't do that. I don't have to know what my next step is right now, but I know what I'm not going to do. So praise the Lord. He said the kingdom of God is about right standing. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. Nothing lacking, nothing broken nothing missing. That's what I want in my life. No matter what's happening around me, no matter what's happening around me, peace, the peace of God. Shalom. How's your peace? How's your peace? Hey, I'm in good shape, man. I don't have to feel like I'm in good shape. I am in good shape emotionally, physically. And eventually, eventually you can get your body to align with your confession and with your belief. Eventually it will happen. Glory to God. But then he says one more thing. This is interesting. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Wow. God must consider this an essential part of the kingdom. He had to throw this in this group. Joy. Joy. What's joy? Well, see, a lot of people don't understand joy. Joy. I believe that joy is a spiritual force. I believe that joy... Uh, comes from the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit. 
And I believe that you can operate in this joy. In fact, in Nehemiah, it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. See, a lot of people think that their, their, their strength comes from being financially secure or being fiscally responsible. And, and I believe that you should be fiscally responsible. I believe that you should have an element of financial security if you're able to do that. Uh, but what if you can't? What, what if you can't? Are you going to be strong or are you going to be just a, a basket case? You know, and, and so you cannot let circumstances dictate how you respond in life. You know, like one pastor said to me, he says, you know, I, I have a better time believing God when there's money in the bank. No, duh. I have a better time believing God when there's money in the bank. Hey, we would all like that, but that's where does faith come in then? If there's no money in the bank, that's when you need some faith going here. When your body feels like it just got run over by a, a, a freight train, that's when you need to stay in faith. You ever notice that when you feel good and everything's just going along real good, you know, you have a tendency to forget some things because, man, I'm doing real good. Life is good. I feel good. I feel good. But all of a sudden you get whacked and you're like, uh, Jesus? <laughs> Maybe I'll slow down. My wife said it this way. She goes, man, it doesn't matter what your plans were. When you get, when you get walloped with sickness or disease, here's what your plans are now. Just get better. You know, praise God. Anyway. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy is a spiritual force. And he says that the kingdom of God is about, he doesn't say righteousness, peace, and fiscal responsibility. He doesn't say that. Righteousness, he doesn't even, he doesn't even say righteousness, peace, and faith. Holy cow. Is that right? Read it for yourself. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, many of us have not tapped into that joy, but I want to tell you that when you reach a saturation point, that will begin to flow. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. In fact, all of the fruits of the Spirit will begin to flow when you reach a saturation point. The trouble is, what do you saturate it with? You're saturated with the thinking that this world is throwing at you continually. You're saturated with the thinking that comes over the TV, it comes over the internet, it comes through your job, it comes through your friends, it comes through your family. You are saturated with that mindset. You've got to get saturated with God and all of these gifts, including this joy that God seems to think is a big deal, including this joy, it will flow. I've noticed this, and I've actually had to force myself to stop laughing. Well, I got put under pressure, something that was not happy. It was not a happy thing. And I started laughing. And I thought, they're going to think I'm out of my mind. What was happening? That joy was bubbling up out of me. It's like I just, I started laughing. In fact, I had one person say, what are you laughing at down there? I said, I'm just, I, I, I'm just laughing. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm in touch with the spirit and I'm getting out of the mind. When I say losing the mind, I don't mean I'm giving my mind away. I'm saying I'm just, I'm detached from that, that thinking in the world. Because the world wants you to do this. What do I do, Rob? What do I do now? What am I going to do? Rob, did you hear what they said to me? What am I going to do? And there's Rob. <laughs> Rob, did you hear what I said? Yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> what are you doing? The joy in the Holy Ghost, man, it's just bubbling up out of me because I stayed saturated all day like you did. And Oh, boy. When you reach that saturation point, the joy will flow. How do I stay saturated? you got to keep drinking. Keep drinking on the things of the Spirit. You have to meditate. You have to think about it. You have to talk about it. You have to engage with it. If you do, listen, how, how else do you become an expert in any field of endeavor? You focus on that. You talk about, people actually have things put up throughout their house, uh, the statements or pictures, and they're, they're fixated on this. They're fixated on this. And you're getting saturated with it until, until you actually see it and it's real to you. Well, you got to do the same thing with the things of God because pressure's going to come. 
If pressure hasn't come yet, just be patient, it's coming. But I promise you, pressure is coming. And here's the thing, God doesn't want you to be knocked over by it. He wants you to just stand there and laugh back at it because it is powerless to hurt you. If you stay centered up on who you are in Christ, if you stay centered up on who he is in you, if you stay centered up on the truths that, that make all the difference in the world, you can just look at that thing and say, listen, you have no power to harm me. I am walking through this valley. I am walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and I fear no evil. Yeah, but this is a pickle. This is a doozy, George. This is a pickle, George. Well, you know what? There are a lot of things that qualify, or they can be considered as a pickle. But always remember this. God didn't wake up this morning when you did, and God didn't look and say, oh, I never saw this coming. This is a pickle. Terry, this is a pickle. I don't know what we're going to do. Let me confer with Michael the archangel here. Isn't it good to know that God's not sweating anything, ever, never. He's never sweating it. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, I have to say this uh, to connect you. Well, I, I, let's just go to Ephesians. Uh, you may not like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. We reference this quite a bit, but I think I have to do it because it just makes sense. God considers joy an essential part of the kingdom. One of the vital characteristics of staying um, sane in this crazy life is to be bubbling over with joy. What do you do with someone that's always laughing? You know, it's like no matter what's happening, what do you like when you punch somebody? When you're oh boy, when you're when you're <laughs> yeah, when you're when you're kind of engaged in the pugilistic endeavors and you pop somebody and he looks at you and he laughs, you're in trouble. You, you know you're in trouble because you just cold cocked this guy and he just looked at you and laughed. And, uh, oh Lord, I was just thinking back to an incident that happened to me many years ago. Um, oh, this is terrible to tell you this, but, um, I, so forgive me ahead of time. This is, this is before commitment. I was in a bar waiting to use the, the facility and I was standing there and a guy came around the corner. And he, he came at me like this, and the next thing I knew, it, my head kept snapping back repeatedly. And I didn't realize it because it happened so fast, but he was punching me. And um, I just, I looked at him like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I just grabbed him and we, we got into it. But, you know, you know you're in trouble when you hit somebody and they laugh at you. It's like, I'm in trouble. I better leave. Well, what happens when the devil's giving you his best shot and you're laughing your way through it? Oh boy, I'm in trouble. I'm going to leave Randy and Julie's house, the devil says, and I'm going to go find someone else's house. And then they go to that house and the person goes, ah, ah, we're in trouble. No, don't say that. Start laughing. If you consider it joy, like James says, if you count it all joy, I wonder if there's a connection to that in this. Count it all joy. I wonder if there's any connection to any of this. Count it all joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I wonder if there's any connection. Yes, because here's the thing. You have to understand that the devil's going to try you more than once in your lifetime. He's going to shake you. He's going to try you. In fact, he's always looking for an opportunity. The Bible says, as a roaring lion, he is looking for someone to devour. So when he goes to the Klein's home and they're laughing their heads off at it, huh? Let me go try Randy and Julie. And they're laughing just as hard down there. And then he goes up to my house. Well, he's going to get the same response. He's going to get the same response regardless of whose house he goes to in this church, right? You're going to just laugh him off of your front porch. Because if you whine and you cry, that opens the door and invites him in. And if you keep whining and crying, he doesn't stand at the front door. Now he goes into the bedroom. Learn the lesson of joy. Learn how to consider this thing and count this thing as joy. If you have to go, ha, 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 what are you doing? I'm counting it as joy. Well, you're doing an awful lot of ha, ha, ha. There's a lot of things to count as joy. Ha, 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 ha. I'm counting it as joy. It doesn't feel like it. Well, I can't do like you do, Pastor. It just doesn't feel right. That's because you're not saturated. If you were saturated, you couldn't help yourself. Where did I tell you to go? Watch this. Here we go. You ready? To get your religious mindset rocked. I love, I love sinking religious boats. This is beautiful. 
this just, this just blows everything out of the water. You ready? This is the Apostle Paul. This is the great Apostle Paul speaking here in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And he says this in verse number, well, let's start in verse number 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. No problem so far. Redeeming the time, in verse 16, because the days are evil. I can say amen to that. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, but wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Hold it. You just compared being drunk with wine to being filled with the Spirit? That doesn't fit in, in, in anywhere in this church. Something so spiritual, he's, connected to, he's connecting it to something so carnal. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Why would he use this analogy? Why would he use this in the same verse? Wait, did Paul lose his mind momentarily? We shouldn't talk about getting drunk with the, in the same verse as being filled with the Spirit. You don't connect those two in the same verse. Being filled with the Spirit is nothing like being, being drunk with wine. I'm sorry, Pastor, I'm drawing the line here. Well, if you consider what I'm about to say, why do people get drunk with wine or alcohol? One of the reasons, number one, is because they want to forget. Or they want to, some, some people call it liquid courage. I need some liquid courage. It loosens me up. I get loose. <laughs> you know, there are different reasons why people get filled up to overflowing with an alcoholic substance. There are different reasons for doing that. Well, <clears throat> if you think about why you should stay full of the Spirit, maybe you need some liquid courage. Maybe you need to forget your old stuff in the past. Maybe you need to forget the old teaching that's been holding you down. Right? There's any number, there's any number of reasons why you should be doing this. The point is, it's exactly the same thing. You can become so saturated with alcohol, it'll change you, won't it? It'll cause you to act different, think different, you'll respond different, you certainly will feel different. If you do the same thing spiritually, it'll have the same effect except it'll be a good effect. It'll keep good stuff flowing out of you. It won't cost you, well, no, it will cost you everything. I used to say it won't cost you, and that'll cost you everything. Because people around you think you're a fruitcake and a nut. But if you get to the place where you can get good and saturated with the Spirit of God, people will think that maybe they'll think that you are drunk with an alcoholic substance. I've had it happen to me more than once. And people say, oh yeah, you were, you were in that church service? You know, you'll, you'll never pass a breathalyzer. To, you know, we come up with all kinds of cute things to say and all that. But the bottom line is when you are saturated and, and that joy thing is bubbling up out of you, it's almost like I don't have any problems. It's almost like I don't care what they are because God's handling it. I don't care what the issue is because it's all going to be okay. I don't care what he said because God gets the last word. I don't care what these symptoms say because the word of God is true regardless. It just brings you to another level, another realm. God doesn't want you beat down by life. God wants you having mastery in life. And some people stay filled with an alcoholic substance because they can't handle their reality. Maybe I'll let that soak in. <laughs> Pun intended. They can't handle their reality. Well, guess what? You don't have to handle your reality all alone. You don't have to. Here's the reality is in and of ourselves, we have nothing to offer. In and of ourselves, this is, this is just, this is, listen, if you, if you take my oxygen away for, for several minutes, I'm falling over and I'm seeing Jesus. And this body, you're going to have to do something with it because I have vacated it. That's how weak we are. That's, that's how weak we are. So my reality, it's, it's a heck of a reality when I think about how vulnerable I am. But if I stay saturated, if I stay good and full, I feel empowered. I feel like I'm worth something. I feel like my life matters. I feel like I'm doing something that's changing the world tonight. When I stay saturated with the presence of God, I actually believe that I am changing this world by doing this uh, church service tonight with you. How crazy is that? 
I actually feel like this isn't a waste of time reading my Bible. I actually feel like it's changing my life. But it all comes by staying saturated. Instead of the other way around where everything's beat down on me and I'm like, oh boy, church again. I don't feel like going out. No, I can't wait to get here. I can't wait to do this. Are you sure you want to go to church tonight? Yes! I love what Rob said coming in the door. I threw everything in the trash and I said, time to go to church. I said, brother, that's what you got to do. Throw everything in the trash and go to church. Time spent with God is not wasted time. And why Paul made that, that connection with alcohol and with the spirit is because Paul knows. Listen, people drink for the same reasons. Just, just drink from the, just drink from the right well. And you too can be a faith champion. And your faith will just excel and soar. We're not getting hung up. Listen, what we're not going to do is we're not getting hung up on who eats what and doesn't eat what. We're not getting hung up on who drinks what and who doesn't drink what. We're not getting hung up on that. Because that's not what the kingdom of God is about. But the kingdom of God is about righteousness or being right with God. Peace, nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And joy in the Holy Ghost. Keep that joy flowing. And you'll, I tell you, you will be amazed at your perspective and your attitude just blazing through things. Like things that would have destroyed you a year ago. I would have just crumbled under this pressure a year ago. Not now. I laugh my way through it. Dance and laugh your way through it. Glory be to God. Well, I got to just ask this uh, of our folks that are watching here. If this has been a blessing to you, I just would like to ask you to share this video so that we can reach even more people through it. And we really appreciate that because we just want to expand the kingdom by preaching this word and getting the word out there as far as we can because the word will not return void. The word will make a way. God's watching over his word to perform it. He's not watching over my word. He's watching over his word. So if I put his words in my mouth and speak his word, God's watching over that to perform it. We get, we get hung up in thinking that, well, you know, it, you're just a man. No, I'm speaking God's word, speaking his word, and he will perform it. I believe he will. Let me pray with you, and then we'll be done. Father, I want to thank you for this opportunity to come together with my brothers and sisters. I thank you for your word. It is forever established and settled. It will never fail. And Father, thank you that you made it simple. The kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Thank you for helping us experience all that you created for us and for being all that you designed us to be in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.